all could uh, learn from being that excited about things sometimes. That's, that's a great, great reminder. Two questions for you. What do you believe about the Bible? Big question. Okay. What do you believe about the Bible? And if something that we see in Scripture teaches something different than a belief that you currently hold, would you be willing to change? Say that one more time. What do you believe about the Bible? And if something Scripture teaches is different than a belief you currently hold, would you be willing to change? Those are huge questions with huge implications. And uh, I want to preface that because really the next three weeks, we are going to be focusing on portions of Scripture in our study within 1 Peter that deal with some issues that I think it's very common to have different beliefs in than what Scripture actually says. Remember, our big picture for this year is this idea of living your life in purpose. And in 1 Peter, we see that Peter is writing to those who have been dispersed. Okay, There's Jews, there's Gentiles who are experiencing persecution for their belief in Christ. And so they are, uh, again, living with this fear. They're living with this idea of what's going to happen. They're living with these questions of what's going on and how do I live with all that's happening and trying yet to do what God wants me to do. And so for us, as we go through life and we are going through the day-by-day things, as we experience opposition sometimes, but as we're going through life, that question of, How am I supposed to live? How can I live on purpose with what God wants for me in the midst of things? And so what Peter is going to start to address uh, today and over the next couple weeks is, first of all, how do I live in this issue of honoring political figures, honoring those who God has put in authority over me? Kind of a subcategory of that, but maybe a different aspect is, how do I live in my relationship with my boss. In that context, it was kind of that slave to master situation, but I think for us today, how do I actually honor my boss? And then two or three weeks from now, we'll be focusing on how do I live in my relationship with my spouse? So those are three different areas where I feel like it's very common for us Maybe to say we believe Scripture is from God and His Word is absolute authority and it guides us, and yet in the actual beliefs and practices that we have in politics, in how we work and honor our bosses, and even in our marriages, our actions don't reflect what our supposed beliefs are. So I want to pray for us, but I encourage you, and I don't mean to set a somber tone or anything like that, but my encouragement as we start today is, are you willing to really evaluate how you go through those different categories and specifically honoring those in authority that God has placed over us, are you willing to evaluate what Scripture might teach if maybe your current actions don't reflect that? So if you would join me in praying that the Holy Spirit would work in us, that he would lead us to what's true today, and we would have hearts that are soft to where God is able to shape us. We wouldn't have self-righteousness, we wouldn't have arrogance, we wouldn't have a sense of knowing all things, but we would be humble and pliable. So if you would pray with me as we get going this morning. Uh, God, we, we love you, we thank you, God, that your word is true. And God, I don't assume everyone in here has that foundation. I don't say that in an arrogant sense, but I know uh, there's people here probably, God, who would maybe claim that. But that's really not where things are at in their life. So, God, I pray your Holy Spirit would do that work first and foremost. God, help us to assess what we believe about your word, what we believe about its authority, what we believe about the ability that we can trust it and build our life upon it. God, help us to assess and evaluate and lead us to a place of truth in how we understand Scripture. But, God, I pray then as we we really acknowledge this is your word, this is what you want for us, would you move us then to shaping our life through your Holy Spirit's power so that it reflects what your word says. I pray for that this morning. Pray that you would guide our hearts. Pray that you would empower Pastor Glenn as he teaches. And uh, help us, Lord, to walk away, God, more in line with what your word says today and to live differently and on purpose because of that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Thank you, Marcus. 
great introduction. You know, I've been, I've been looking forward to this passage for weeks and weeks now. And we, we were going to do that right before Easter. You remember that? We came up to that. In fact, we saw this sermon title in the bulletin right before Easter. But then we thought, well, you know, we, it, it's, it's Palm Sunday and we probably should focus there. And so we used the same title, Honor the King, to talk about Christ and his entry into Jerusalem. And then last week, yeah, after the Easter season, we came, came back to the passage. And last week, we were going to talk about it again. And I only got halfway through the sermon. So we're going to try again. And we're going to get there. Today, we are going to get there. We're going to talk about what it means to honor the king. And I've been looking forward to this passage. As we look at this passage, though, we really do need to understand it kind of in that context, to, to frame it in the context that, that Peter is addressing some very specific issues. And this whole idea that how we live matters. Last week, we kind of looked at this idea, and we, we picked up on verse 11 of chapter 2, where Peter writes, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war among your soul. And we kind of looked at that, and we unfolded it, and just kind of gave it the paraphrase and the understanding that we don't belong here. This, this world doesn't own us, and we don't belong in this world. We are different. We've been changed. This is not our home. We don't belong here. And so because we don't belong here, we have to live differently. We have to live differently. And so the encouragement is stop giving in to every selfish impulse. Peter uses the words fleshly lust, but it's that same thing. That we, we just can't give in to every desire that, that impulses us, that, that comes our way because we feel like it. We have to live differently. And, and the contrast to that, in, in contrast to giving in to every selfish impulse, was this instruction to keep our behavior excellent. Again, we're in chapter 2 of First Peter. Verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war among your, uh, among your soul, against your soul. And then verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. That we have to keep our behavior excellent. You remember that word, Kilos, kailos is the Greek word, and it just means that which is good, that which is excellent, that which is delightful or winsome or inviting. That's how our behavior should be. And, and as we unfolded that, we realized that as, that as Peter describes this, some things are going to be true. If, if our behavior is excellent among the Gentiles, some of the things are going to be true. And we just had to grab a hold of the idea that that even though we don't belong here, we were never made and meant to be isolated. This world is not our home, but we were called to be right in the middle of this world and making a difference. And even though we don't belong here, we're never to be in isolation. The second thing we saw, and we, we unfolded all this last, year, last time, but selfish impulses will never produce what is good and delightful and winsome. I'm following what makes me feel good, if I'm just following my own selfish desires, that is never going to produce good, delightful, and winsome. We saw last time, verse 3, or the third thing, um, just kind of this admonition, this warning, don't be put to shame by the good deeds of those who don't even know Christ. Sometimes Christians are out-Christianed by non-Christians. Don't let that happen. Let the world see your good behavior, your excellent behavior, your delightfulness so that God is glorified in that. And then this realization that even when we do what is good and delightful and excellent, we'll still be opposed. You're still likely to be opposed and accused and slandered. But the fifth thing, don't underestimate the, underestimate the impact that your good behavior has in the world, even among those who would slander you. Right at the end of that verse, Peter says, 
that they may, because of your good behavior as they observe it, glorify God in the day of visitation. And as we unfold that, we understand that it, it's this idea, and this is what drives us to have different behavior. When Christ appears, they will glorify him rather than cower before him. And you know why they glorify him? Because they have seen your life and it's impacted their life. And they also have come to the point where they have embraced the Savior. That's really what it's getting to. That as they observe you following Jesus and living Christ, it impacts them so much that they want what you want. And they're one to, one to Christ. That's why we do that. So now we come to the really practical and radical application of it's practical and it is radical. You know, as Peter is writing this, when he talks about submitting for the Lord's sake, as verse 13 says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. When he talks about that, he's not talking about just religious theory. This isn't just an academic pursuit and an academic understanding that he's putting before them. He's talking about real life. And as we understand, we just you know, know that these believers aren't living in a culture under a government system that is always favorable to Christians. Persecution is a reality. And so when he says, honor the king, submit to the king, he's not talking about religious theory talking about real life and you know what when we come to this passage and we talk about submit yourself for the lord's sake to every human institution this is not just academic knowledge that we're talking about we're talking about submitting to those who are in authority let me show you a couple portraits here um, you might recognize these guys go ahead joe put them up there yeah anybody recognize these so the the, the guy on the left there, yeah, thank you. That's uh, Barack Obama. He was a Democrat, the president. Maybe you knew that. The guy on the right, that's uh, Donald Trump, Republican. He's a president. You know, I, I got to admit here, I was almost secretly hoping that somebody would boo at this point. So I could say, stop it! Because that's really what this passage is about. You know, how do we honor those who are in authority over us. Now, I don't know what's going on in your heart and your mind as you look at those pictures. Maybe, you know, you've got that inner turmoil going on there. Maybe, you know, you're looking at one side or the other and your jaw is starting to clinch a little bit. Saying, you realize in our culture today, we see it all over, that, and I, I've said this before, it, it's, it's in vogue. It, it's vogue to hate. It's in style to hate and, and to be vocal about your opposition and to spew that hatred. It, it's in style. It's, it's culturally acceptable to just really be so adamantly against something that, that hatred spills out and anger spills out. You know what's really even more amazing? That those who are the loudest those who are the most vehement about their, their opposition. It doesn't matter what you're opposing, but if you're loud about it and you're vehement about it, that, that those people are kind of held up as heroes right now. It's in vogue to hate. You know, and, and may, maybe we, I, I give it this term, and I don't know if this is an official term, but for our purposes, we'll, we'll call it this, to rage. Raging is popular right now. Find a cause. Find something that you're against and then just rage against it. And, and the more vehement you are, the more hateful your speech is, the more adamant you are about being against that, the more you rage, the more you'll be applauded by our culture. Because it's popular right now. Believer, Christian, that has no place in your life. Rage has no place in the life of a believer. So we, we think about that. And we, we come to this misconception. And I'm going to give you two or three misconceptions. But, you know, this idea that, 
that um, raging for a worthy cause is the same as ex excellent behavior. If I can justify my cause, if it's a really good cause, then I can be justified in raging and spewing that same anger and hate. Believer, that's not so. Raging is raging, and it has no place in the life of a believer. When we look at the passage here, there are two words that are almost counterculture words. When we talk about these things, it almost goes against that, that popular idea and the popular notion in our culture, and they almost become fighting words. First word is submit. We see it here in verse 13. Look at it. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to a governor as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers or the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, by the way. Submit. Submit. That's kind of a, kind of a fighting word, kind of a negative word in our culture. Submit. Submit. You know what it means. The, the Greek word here is hupotasso. I love that Greek word, hupotasso. And it just, it, it means this, really, to get in order. To get in order. You know, sometimes with our kids down in kids club, we'll say, okay, we want you to line up tallest to shortest. Get in order. That's hupotasso. Or you could say, get in order uh, according to the, your age. The oldest ones here down to the youngest ones. Get in order. Hupotasso. Or Alphabetical. It just means to, to get into order. So what does that word mean as we apply it here? To submit yourselves to every human institution. We're doing that for the Lord's sake. Well, it, it just means this. To, to submit. To get in line behind every authority that God has placed in your life. To get in line behind every authority that God has placed in your life. And, and if you're not in line, if you're out of line, you're out of what God wants you to do. And we would say you're, you're out of what God wills in your life. So now as we say that, we think about um, kings and governors and masters and, and family and, you know, for us, the application is those who are in authority, the national leaders and local authorities and, and employers, employees and family relationships and teachers and, and, and all of those authorities, that we have to get in line behind all of those. And as I say that, I know right now the wheels are spinning. Some of you are looking for the out clause. You're looking for the exception. You're saying, yeah, but... I mean, we agree with that in theory. We agree that, you know, the Word of God is true. But isn't there an exception? Isn't there, um, you know, a case where I can disregard that? Because we say, well, you know, civil disobedience. Don't we have a right to civil disobedience? I, isn't it even res we're expected to do that? You know, we have a responsibility to keep our leaders in check. Isn't there an out clause? Well, two things that I would say here. Number one, I think the word of God means what it says and says what it means. So when God says, submit to every institution, every leader, every authority, I think he means that. And, and the other thing that we would have to say here is just because it's culturally acceptable doesn't mean that it's the same as a biblical mandate. And when the two are in conflict, which one do we go with? Biblical mandate. So Peter writes, submit to every human institution. And, and which human institutions are indicated here? Well, it's every one of them. To submit, to get in line behind. But then he says this other thing. And we see it a little later on, down here in verse 13. Actually, um, verse 17 kind of the summary statement, honor all people, verse 17 says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. It's interesting to unfold that. We'll do this a little more next time when we talk about um, servants and being submissive to their masters, but 
it's interesting to unfold this to say, okay, what does he have in mind here? Because we're to honor, we're to honor everyone, honor all people. And then maybe the middle two is a little easier for us. It's easier for us to love the brothers, to love our fellow believers, and it's maybe easier for us to fear God. But to honor all people, and especially to honor the king, that just rubs me the wrong way. I don't want to do that. I'm looking for the out clause. Part of the problem with not wanting to honor is, is, is this mindset that I that we often struggle with. And the mindset is, that it, it's a win or lose mindset. We just kind of have that mentality that we either win or we lose. And in sports, that's often the case. You know, somebody wins, somebody loses. That's, that's athletics. But in life, we, we try to apply that win-lose, that if I win, that means you lose. Or if you win, then I have to lose. Now, you realize how damaging that is in the realm of marriage, right? If I let my wife win a disagreement, that means I lose, and I can't lose. So I'll fight bitterly to, to not lose, to fight bitterly to not be wrong, even when I'm wrong, because it's win or lose. You, you understand how that works? But, but think about that. Now, in this, this whole realm of honor, giving honor, because if I honor you, that means that I am dishonored. If, if I want to be honored, if I'm seeking to be honored and, and lifted to this high position, that means that you have to be dishonored. You have to be shamed. And, you know, really this, this whole word honor, it means to, it means to regard. To regard highly. To to give value and worth to. And we struggle with that because if I give value and worth to you, that means I, you know, in this mindset that I'm less valuable. I am less worthy. Now, you think about how that applies to this whole political arena that we are living in. Because if I am to honor one political ideology or one political candidate, that means that I have to dishonor the other. And, and I honor my candidate by dishonoring. If I can shame and dishonor the other candidate, then my candidate is lifted up. And I can't honor one and allow the other to be honored. And that's really the mindset that we struggle with. That's really the mindset that our culture struggles with. And so this is radical. This is so radical when Peter says, now, honor the king. And he doesn't say, if you agree with him. It says, honor the king. You've got to, you've got to ascribe that he, is, he has got value and he's got worth. In fact, not just the king, but everybody. The people that disagree with you, the people around you, the people who rub you the wrong way, the people who will oppose you and slander you, you've got to lift them up as somebody of value and worth. And it doesn't mean that you are negated. It doesn't mean that you are shamed because we can do both. It's win and win. It's not win or lose. Win and win. So what does that mean? So how, how do we do that? How do we honor? How do we do honor the king? Well, it's to... Um, the, whole, the whole definition of honor is to consider them to be of value, to consider them to be worth, to hold them in high regard, and we do that with actions, and we do that with our words, with our attitudes and our speech. We hold them up. So let's, let's go, back to, go back to those pictures. Joe, would you put those portraits back up for us? Here we go. Boom. There they are. There they are. How, how do we do that with, with attitudes and actions? Well, first of all, with our actions, we just make sure that you are being obedient that you are an obedient citizen in the country in which you live, and you are not, you are not released from, from that obedience simply because you are a follower of Christ. Now, again, there's a phrase in here that I want to unfold a little more next time. 
But it's in verse 16. It says, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of God. It's interesting. Back in Montana, 100 years ago when we used to live there, there was a group not far from us that called themselves the free men. That's where they got this. But when they called themselves the free men, they were calling themselves exempt from all laws of the United States. You, you know who they were because they drove the pickup trucks without a license plate on it and a gun in the gun rack. You could tell who they were. And they were saying, we're, you know, the government is corrupt, therefore we are absolved of any obedience to the United States government. We are free men. Peter says it differently. He says, act as free men. Act as those who have been set free from slavery and, and being that bondage of sin, being enslaved by sin, but don't use that as an excuse to disobey the law. In fact, even more so because you are bond slaves of God, you do what is right. You have to live differently. So how, how do we do that? Well, we, we obey the law. But you know what? I want to look at the other aspect of that right now, that we honor the king not just with our actions, which are important, but also with our words. We back up to the first verse of chapter 2. Marcus unfolded this for us a while back. We kind of looked at those words. We're instructed to put away, to put aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and, and envy and slander. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at those individually. We're, we're meant to put away. We're instructed to put away all malice. What is malice? Malice is... It's being evil. Go ahead and put that one up there, Joe. Put away malice. It, it, it's evil. It's, it's a vicious, I like this definition. Malice is a vicious disposition. Put away a vicious disposition. And it's really, it's, it's exhibited in this idea that we delight in the harm of those we oppose. That's what malice is. That we would delight in, we delight in their harm. We delight in, the, in their downfall. And we would wish for and we would even plan for their downfall. That ruin would come to them. That's, that's malice. Peter says you've you got to put that away. You can't wish for the downfall of those you disagree with. You can't delight in their harm and hope and wish them harm. Peter also says, put away all deceit and hypocrisy. So what is this deceit and hypocrisy that we're putting away? Now, so when we're talking about deceit and hypocrisy, it's not their deceit and hypocrisy. It's, it's your deceit and hypocrisy. And you know, just think about it in this term, that you can't harbor malice and you can't rage and pretend that you have the spiritual moral high ground. You can't pretend that, that you're walking with Christ and let these things be obvious in your life as well because they are mutually exclusive. You can't do both. In fact, we would also say this, that you can't be a proclaimer of the love and the mercy of God while at the same time being one who is raging against something that you're against and spewing hate. You can't do both. So put away that hypocrisy. Put away that deceit to make sure that what you are doing is pleasing to God. And then it says, put away all slander. Put away, what, what is slander? Well, that's evil speech. And the slander, the evil speech, is speech that is meant to, to defame, to belittle, to destroy. That can't come out of your mouth. If you're one who is proclaiming the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God, you can't do both. Put away all slander. So it comes to the misconception that you see up there. The misconception is, and we're trying to get this, this excuse, this out clause, the exception clause, the misconception is that I can justify harboring malice or speaking slander because of the kind of authorities I have. Yeah, that, that in theory, you know, we agree that 
general principle, the word of God is true, honor the king, but they don't know what kind of king we have. They don't know what kind of authorities we have. In fact, we're going to say God didn't really anticipate what we have to live under. Well, that's a misconception, isn't it? Did God know what kind of system we're going to live under? Did, did he know that? Absolutely he did. So did he, did he say this with forethought? Absolutely he did. So it's a misconception to say, you know, I'm, I'm justified in harboring malice. I'm justified in speaking slander about my leaders, my authorities, because, well, my authorities are really bad. Misconception. How do we do that? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, you know, it's not about you. That's the really thing that you need to understand. Go back to verse 13. There's a phrase here that we might just jump over because we get so excited about the word submit and then every human institution. But it says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake. It's not for your sake. It's not for your sake. He doesn't say submit yourself because you feel like it. Submit yourself because you agree with your leader. Submit yourself to the authority because you like the policies and you like the direction that he's leading. Submit yourself because it makes you feel good. That's not even the case. It's not about you. It's not for your sake. In fact, that leads us to misconception number three. You're going to just have to write this down. The command to submit is not conditioned upon your feelings. Whether or not you feel like it, whether or not you agree with it, whether or not it's easy or comfortable, there's a command to submit. And that's where you need to be. It's not about you. And, you know, in the same vein, it's not about the king either. It's not, you don't submit to the king for the king's sake. Whether or not they deserve it, whether or not you agree with them, or whether or not they, they may be corrupt and immoral. They may be making huge mistakes or leading in a way that's contrary to popular opinion. It's not for their sake. You know what it's for? It's for the Lord's sake. That you submit for the Lord's sake. And that's what he says here. And, and we just unfold this really quickly. But um, number one, because he commanded it. Why should we submit to authority, to every human institution? Well, because he commanded it. Because you're told to do that. And when he commands, I think, I think the word of God means what it says and says what it means. And, and there is a purpose for that. Maybe one of those purposes is, is just this understanding that, that the reputation of Christ is impacted by the way that you live this out. The reputation of Christ is impacted by the way you submit to earthly authorities because this is radical, so radical. The, the reputation of Christ being impacted before the world that you live in. So that, you know, go back to that idea, in the day of visitation, there might be some who say, you know, I don't understand it, but, but they just... They, they were different. They lived differently. It was because, because of this Jesus they followed. And, and I want to know that same Jesus. The reputation of Christ is impacted. And, you know, in truth, this is the will. This is the plan of God. Verse 15. Peter, in the middle of that statement, says, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. This is, this is what he has meant for us all along, that he doesn't mean for us to isolate. He means us to be part of a world and part of a community. We don't isolate in that community so that we can be an impact in that community. And, in that sense, to silence those foolish men. And we could talk about foolish men, but I, I think in this context, what he has in mind is just this. Those who think they know what Christianity is all about, and those who would set that up and knock it down and, and, and slander Christ and slander the Bible and slander Christians, that as they see your life, that their, their words would be proven to be foolish, that their attitudes 
would be proven to be foolish because they can't deny the reality of Jesus in your life by your good behavior. How do Christians live in this culture, and how do Christians address culture? How do, we, how do we live that out and make a difference? Does this mean, you know, when we are to put away all slander and malice, when we're to honor the king, when we're to submit to authorities, does that mean that we, we just say nothing? Is that what the word of God is calling us to do? Just to be quiet, keep your head down, don't make waves, don't be involved. Is that what it means? No, I'd say just the opposite. I believe that Christians need to be the most involved. I think that Christians need to be involved in the the needs and the concerns of their community. I think that Christians need to be about addressing injustice, doing what is right, but it's different than the way the world does it. Keep your behavior excellent. Keep your behavior excellent. Can I just give you three things? I, I think this is practical. Practical ways to do that. Christians, I I think that you need to speak out about issues. You need to be politically involved. You You need to have your voice heard. Speak out about issues without, without maligning somebody's character. You can do that, you know. You can talk about issues, you can talk about what is right, and you can address what is right and do that without maligning the character of somebody you disagree with. Speak to issues, don't malign character. It doesn't matter whose character it is. Speak to issues, don't malign character. Here's the number two thing. Be known, and you've heard me say this a lot of times, be known for what you are for and not what you're against. That that should be absolutely true of our church. We should be known for what we are for and not simply rage against what we are against. We keep our behavior excellent. This is what is good. This is what is right. This is what is delightful. This is what we want to be known for. You know, in in a sense, we could say this another way. And, And maybe you've heard it expressed this way, but don't simply bring me criticism. Bring me solutions. And, and we kind of forget that. We, we're really good at complaining about everything we don't like and complaining about the people we don't like and maligning the people that we don't like. But, you know, don't, don't just bring me complaints. Bring me a solution. And as you bring me a solution, then demonstrate that. Here, That's the third thing. Demonstrate what is good by what you do. So it's not just talking. And it's not just criticizing, certainly isn't criticizing. It's not just talking about what could be good. It, it's doing what is good. Keep your behavior excellent. Let me give you just a couple quick examples of that, really practical living examples here that, that we've seen. One is this, this whole idea of family promise. I'm kind of amazed when Marcus reminded us we've been doing this for two years. Do you remember why we started that and what the cultural debate was when we started it two years ago? It was the the Syrian refugees, and that was a huge crisis. And and there was a group of people that said, you know, if we really are compassionate people, we need we need to uh, we need to address that. And then there's another group of people, and this is culture wide. That's not just our church. Another group of people said, yeah, but we need to deal with the homelessness in our own community first. We need to be compassionate about these refugees, or we need to be compassionate about our, our own neighbors and address that homelessness. And you know what? That debate was meaningless because nothing was happening. And so rather than entering into that debate, we just said, well, let's do something. Let's put our shoulder to something. Let's bring a solution. Let's not just complain about one group or another. Let's bring a solution. And so we started addressing this. Another example, and we're just kind of seeing this and beginning to uh, explore this, but maybe you've seen the flyers on the bulletin board in the bathrooms, uh, the Gabriel Project that Teresa is involved with. 
similar to what Chad and Christy Atkins are doing now in Texas. Th this whole debate of uh, are, are we against abortion? Or are we for the sanctity of life? And we could enter into that debate and we could rage about that or we could do something. We could put our shoulder to something and demonstrate our love and our compassion by what we do. Christian, you can't join the noise of your culture, of this culture. You don't belong here, so it's not for you. And since you don't belong here, you have to live differently. And as you live differently, the world's going to notice it. They're not always going to like it. You'll be slandered. You will be opposed. But they can't deny the reality of Christ in your life. And that, that, that first example is... How do you respond to those who are in authority over your life? Where do you need to change? Next week, we'll, we'll talk about slaves and masters. And then we'll talk about family relationships. And in all of that, we live differently because we live Christ. Amen? Father, we thank you.